Hi everybody! I am Net Nursing Prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about warfarin versus heparin. How can you tell them apart? The first thing I want to say about these medications is that they are anticoagulant medications. Normally, people will call these blood thinners, but that name is a little bit misleading because that's not what they do. And when it comes to clots in the body, it is not their job to dissolve or break down clots that are already formed. Their job is to slow down the clotting process in the first place. So let's get into them. The first thing we need to know is how do they work? So the way warfarin works is it antagonizes vitamin K, which then prevents the synthesis of four coagulation factors. So this is factor seven, factor nine, factor 10, and prothrombin. Heparin, on the other hand, prevents clotting by activating antithrombin, which then indirectly inactivates thrombin and factor XA. And what are the uses for these medications? A lot of them are very similar. So uses to treat um, venous thrombosis, um, venous thrombosis in people with AFib or some sort of, you know, a heart valve problem, and to prevent recurrent MI, which is a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, a TIA, trans ischemic attack, so a mini stroke, PE, pulmonary embolism, so the blood clot that goes into the lung, and then DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So this is when you have the thrombus in the calf, in the deep veins of the lower extremities. The uses for heparin are very similar. So PE, prophylaxis against post-operative DVT development. So a lot of times heparin might be given after somebody's had an operation, especially if it's been like a hip replacement or a knee replacement surgery. And then it can also be used to treat DIC in some patients. Heparin is one of those medications that has a lot of uses. We can also use heparin to flush. We don't use it so commonly anymore because of the saline flushes, but you can use heparin to flush to prevent clots forming in peripheral and central venous lines. Now let's talk about some more key facts. Now let's talk about onset, duration, labs, and antidotes. For warfarin, its onset is very, very slow. It could take several hours, like 12 to 24 hours. So it takes its time. Whereas heparin is very quick, right? Less than one hour. So that's an easy way to tell them apart. Another easy way to tell them apart is their duration. So warfarin lasts a long time. It can last days. Its duration can be even like three to five days long, okay? So its duration is much longer. Whereas heparin has a very short duration and only lasts for a few hours. When it comes to the various routes of administration, warfarin is most typically given orally, so PO by mouth. But what's special about that is it needs to be given usually once a day and it has to be done at the same time every day. So that's important patient teaching there. And yes, we could also give it IV, but you, the nurse, would be in charge of doing that. As far as heparin, its route is subcutaneous or by IV injection. It has to be subcutaneous or IV because the oral form is not absorbed by the GI tract. So this one has to be an injectable. And if you are injecting subcutaneously, you need to remember to rotate those sites, okay? So if you did the left side earlier, do the right side next time, that kind of thing. When it comes to important lab values, warfarin, the big ones here, are your PT, INR, and then your liver function studies, which is your AST and your ALT. And when it comes to heparin, it's your APTT and your platelets. We'll talk a little bit later about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, so that's why your platelet count matters so much with heparin. And I do actually have two other videos, one on the PTINR and one on the PTT. They're real short. I'll put them below if you want to check those out. When it comes to antidotes, this is very, very important information. So warfarin, the antidote for warfarin is vitamin K. 
And you can remember that because of the way warfarin works in the body by antagonizing vitamin K. And when it comes to heparin, the antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate, which is something that you, the nurse, would give. It's an IV med, and you would give it very slowly. So those are the antidotes. Those are really, really important things to know about these meds. Now let's talk about some side effects and complications. Now let's compare some side effects and potential complications. With warfarin, some common side effects include fever, diarrhea, and rashes. Some not so common but serious side effects include hemorrhage and then hematuria, which is the blood in the urine. When it comes to heparin, very similar story there. We have fever, we have rash, we have the blood in the urine. But in this case, we also could potentially have something called thrombocytopenia, which is a lower platelet count. If you notice complications, again, they have something that matches hemorrhage, because that's kind of what it does, right? So it stops the blood from clotting, so you are at higher risk of having a hemorrhage. So if your patient, if we suspect a hemorrhage, what are we going to be assessing? We're going to assess bleeding, any weird bruising, any black tarry stools, and of course, taking their vital signs, making sure they're not in like hypovolemic shock or something like that. When it comes to some differences, a potential complication for warfarin is hepatitis. So we want to assess the patient for jaundice. And this is the reason when we look at the labs, we want to look at that AST and those ALT, those liver function tests. And when it comes to heparin, the other one besides hemorrhage is something called HIT, which is just heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So those are some things we want to look for. Now let's talk about some patient teaching. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the patient education. So this is all the stuff that you need to know about these medications so that you can teach the patient. So when it comes to patient teaching, a big, big thing for warfarin is it interacts with a lot of other medications. So some of these medications can cause the patient to be at higher risk for bleeding, whereas some of these medications will decrease the effectiveness of the warfarin. So, just to touch on a little bit, the patient needs to avoid aspirin, that's what ASA means by the way, aspirin, acetaminophen, glucocorticoids, and sulfonamides because they can all increase somebody's bleeding risk. On the flip side of that are phenobarbital, dilantin, and oral contraceptives, so like the birth control pill. All of those medications will decrease the effectiveness of the warfarin. So this is really important to know what your patient is taking. When it comes to diet, you want to let them know no dark green leafy vegetables, no alcohol, because remember this does affect the liver, that's why we're worried about hepatitis and we're checking those liver function studies, and no grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice is just kind of a bad guy altogether in most medications, isn't it? So no alcohol, no grapefruit juice. You want to tell them to avoid sitting for long periods of time and to stop the medication five to seven days before having a surgery or dental work. And normally the doctor will instruct them of this. So if they know they have a procedure coming up, the doctor will probably let them know in advance, I need you to stop taking your warfarin because you're at higher risk of bleeding too much during the surgery. When it comes to heparin, very similar. So not as many interactions with other medications, but there are some. So you want to avoid aspirin, NSAIDs, and salicylates. And I put little blue dots next to these because they also apply over here. I just ran out of room. So you want to tell both patients, heparin and warfarin patients, to use an electric razor to shave. So if they're a man shaving their beard. A soft bristle toothbrush because they're at higher risk for having bleeding gums. And no contact sports. So anything that's going to be a little bit more rough and tumble where they could possibly get hurt and bleed, we want them to avoid those things. And then another one last special thing I wanted to point out about warfarin is you need to instruct the patients that even after they stop taking it, like it's been discontinued, they are still at risk for bleeding. 
So they may bleed more easily for several days even after discontinuing the medication. And that is because it has such a long duration. Remember we talked about that earlier? Three to five days. So they have quite some time. So you stop taking it on Monday, it doesn't mean by Wednesday that it's all out of your system and you're fine. Right? So very, very important things you need to let our patients know about. So that was my video, Warfarin versus Heparin. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.